Oh, well, that goes back to the day when the war was declared. And I can remember at school the teacher, he just read this publication in the daily paper, how we were committed to war. And I couldn't hold myself. And, and I, I just said, bawled out, I'll be there. And that's, that was in 1914 when the war was declared. Well, I knew that when I was old enough and able to go, I would, yes, I, I would enlist. Well, then uh, we were uh, building light railways and plank roads and things like that. And general work, just general engineering work. We didn't go into action properly until um, the 20th of September. I think I described that, you know, I had a shell, I was lucky I got out of that. One of our own shells lobbed within about three feet of the trench I dug. Luckily I was stooping down, if I had my head up I might have had a blown off. One time we put up for a rest at a rat infested tunnel in Camel Hill. The next morning, after the usual wash at a nearby shell hole, one of my covers burst out laughing, pointing to my head. Have you seen yourself this morning, Kizzy? He asked. No, I said. What's so funny about it? Go and have a deco with yourself. <laughs> In your glass, he said laughing. This I did pronto. And discovered the rats had enjoyed themselves during the night and ate quite a lot of my long hair. Fortunately, they were considered creatures because uh, they didn't chew my hair off near my scalp, but left about an inch of it. I wasn't a pretty sight. So that there was all kinds of chores to do. I sometimes would be carrying rations up to the front line. Then uh, the 12 of us were detailed for a special wiring party on the left of Villas Britno. So uh, we were built in a little village, La Navelle, near Corby, and we would carry up on our shoulders the steel pickets and the rolls of barbed wire for the night's exercise because we could only go out after last light and we had to be in off no man's land before first light. So finally, just before daylight, in drizzling rain, we were on the move. Our NCOs and our officers were in charge again. And we were led up to an old line of trenches that was grassed over. And uh, I reckon that would be about seven or 800 yards from the first German line of defence and uh, in this line our fellas filed in, I was following up and uh, then I, I, I found myself uh, waiting for the zero hour and I just knelt down and said the little prayer <laughs> that lived in my memory ever since <laughs> and uh, I would say the same thing today, but uh, that morning <laughs> I said, please God, bless mother and father, bless brothers and sisters, whatever becomes of me, then I thought no more of a prayer or anything else. And then immediately after Jack Adams ran along the top of the trench and he bawled out, fix bayonets and load up. And then he came back still running up, boys and atom, keep going, there is no objective. We started our attack at 11.55 p.m. after the barrage had lifted. Our objective was the ridge at the windmill, Pozzeers. I read the ode there in 1978 on our Diamond Jubilee trip. The wire was supposed to have been cut but unfortunately it wasn't, excepting for a little bit where I, the particular spot where I was, where the outer section managed to get through. But a, yeah, but a, uh, 
a shrapnel bomb burst over us, and uh, that's the end of it. I was badly wounded, the left leg being smashed and open nearly from the knee to the ankle with a bullet through the foot. When we're at what you call Hill 60, that's the place they blew up eventually, they had all dug out under the hill. Well there, there was a lot of mustard gas and uh, the Germans used to send over these uh, uh, sneezing gas and you couldn't help sneezing and you couldn't put your helmet on it <laughs> when the mustard gas log. So I've seen plenty of that. Oh, I've seen chaps go out. It's weak at that mustard gas. Yes, that hill 60. I've seen quite a lot go out with there. It's said that uh, some of our fellas just rested their, their guns on the wire and fired from there while others uh, uh, tried to uh, deal with the wire. But Nigger Wilson ran along the, 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 the wire in front of us and he found the opening which had been left to let their own patrols through. But because he was an old soldier, he knew he'd find that opening and he led us through the, the wire. The wire was alive with bullets as we went through and he just bellowed out, form a line charge and then we went, took the trench. The stretcher bearers were coming out from a little sunken part of the road and uh, they tied a handkerchief on their stretcher and the, the guns that would fire, the Germans honoured that, the, the stretcher bearers, they raced out, got their man, brought him in and they went out time and time again to bring their man in and each time the gunners just honoured those stretcher bearers. Oh my word. It's, uh, that was the coldest winter they had for 35 years when we were there. Oh yes, the ground was frozen. When you went to dig to uh, dig a trench, you'd see the sparks fly off the pick handle when it was you know, the ground. That's a fact. You wouldn't believe it until you got through about three or four inches. Then you get onto the earth. Mm. But that's how to do before you could dig your trench. They were marvellous chaps. But what, it, that put me against smoking. You'd be in the trenches and they'd have to light, a, light up to save their nerves, they'd say. You know what I mean? Probably give our posse away. And I used to say I'd like to soothe their nerves with a something big stick. <laughs> but of course, Charlie is just one of those fellas that's still over there in the poppy field. I, I went to visit Charlie one day. We went to a different company than I was. And the boy said, no, Charlie was reading a letter from home and, and a shell came over. We couldn't find a, enough of Charlie to bury him. But so that you see, that, that's war. War is hell on earth as man makes it. <laughs>